So welcome everyone. I'm super happy today because uh, I have a fr another friend today again uh, on one of our webinars, and it's um, she. She's like everyone knows Liz in in the US and and, and far beyond, and it's really uh, great to have her today. So Liz, welcome. Thank you. Uh, we always start with a like um, a fun fact about our guest, and we we've been talking about your fun fact, and I quite like it. So off you go. Well, fun fact about me is that before I got into e-commerce uh, and before I actually got into freelance writing, which was my career before, I professionally hosted karaoke and emceed corporate parties, wedding receptions, that kind of stuff. So I was a traveling troubadour and arbiter of parties. So I think you're still a, a bit of a troubadour, no? A little bit, yes. I just have I have something that I believe in, which is e-commerce and helping Amazon yeah. sellers and e-commerce sellers. More so than whole... karaoke. Okay, I get Although, it. Although there there's something very rewarding about in the US, most of our karaoke is in a restaurant or a bar. So even if you're not singing, you've got to listen to the people that are singing because that's the entertainment for the night. And there's something really great about somebody's nervous or somebody's never sang in public before and they get up and they kill it and everybody cheers for them and there's just something really nice about that <clears throat> I don't know if it's still like that because I don't go out anymore I'm kind of a hermit but it was good it was good while it lasted yeah and we'll, maybe we'll talk about it to today but we will get to meet in Las Vegas very soon uh, for the Prosper show and we might have a, a chance to get the thing who knows but we'll, we'll keep, let's keep that for a bit later Liz let's talk about a bit about yourself now and about Tika Metrics the okay. solution uh, you represent today Okay, well, so as a little bit of background about me, my name is Liz Downing. I've been in the e-commerce world since about 2014 when, like I said before, I was a freelance writer and I got hired to edit an ebook about <clears throat> something that you should do with your Amazon customers. And I was like, who can have Amazon customers? I thought just Amazon had Amazon customers. So that led me into freelance writing for Ecom Engine, which is a great uh, software company in this space. They've been around for a really long time. And I went to work for a local seller and learned the inside of Seller Central and learned all about Ecom Engine's tools and went to work for them full time. And I was with them for about four years. And then in, uh, in mid COVID, August 2020, I joined Take a Metrics and um, I'm on the marketing team. And I focus most of my time on partnerships with my friends like Jerome here and with uh, in person events, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later. So Take a Metrics is also a software company, but we also have a services side. And our mission is to help you maximize your potential on e-commerce marketplaces. So we, we focus mainly on advertising, Amazon advertising, um, <clears throat> Walmart advertising. We've expanded into eBay advertising and we're looking at other channels. And we have AI powered technology, which is super cool, which means we've got all the data, but we also have a really great managed services team that will manage your ads for you if you don't want to use the self-serve tool. So um, we're not a full service agency. We don't do listing optimization and all that jazz. We just focus on advertising and the, the, the things you need to pay attention to to make good decisions about your advertising. And is uh, DSP also linked? Can you link DSP to Tika Metrics today? So the oh, full, yeah. Oh. We're having fun with DSP. That's great. So we're big about technology, like technology for us is super important for, for people, for brands wanting to expand in e-commerce and like technology for content. And we've, we've talked a lot about, you know, how to organize and send content, but also on, on advertising and automation and how to like optimize and, and improve your, the results you're, you're having in, in your advertising. And for me, Tika metrics is one of the few in the market, which has really got, um, an amazing solution which really works well which we also uh, recommend very much so well boom that was your, the That's two minutes great. of me i gotta tell you the the amount of data that ai can achieve is mind-blowing i'm pretty old and i mean i come from i didn't grow up with a computer they didn't have cell phones when i was a teenager uh, i went to college with a beeper that I then gave to someone else because they wanted it more than I did. And I, it's just astounding to me what we're able to, and, and not just in the advertising space, you know, AI is creeping into all different types of technologies. And I guess there's some sort of 
like dystopian movies about it and stuff like that. But really, when you use it for good, it's super powerful and it's just really cool. So let's jump into it like AI. So it's a bit of a buzzword, but let's like let's get into the nitty gritty details of that. It's like, what does it do in in like we're not like we're not IT specialists, both of us, but it's like how could you explain it for me to understand like what in which case is used AI and to perform? How does it help to perform better and which type, kind of tasks? Mainly in the analysis of your data and helping you make better decisions. So pulling in data from different platforms, from different levers that you're pulling while you're trying to run your business and then putting them into a format that you can understand and then suggesting what you should do next. Um, so what kind of platform is it? You're talking about Amazon, Walmart, these kind of platform or different other platforms? Well, so currently with our current Flywheel product, we're not able to pull in everything, but Flywheel 2.0 is this close and it's going to pull in everything so you're going to be able to look at your data and make great decisions about your advertising based on how your ads have been performing to date what what the keywords are doing what your competitors are doing um market intelligence on different category different category trends um how much inventory do you have and how can you be making decisions about your advertising based on the amount of inventory you have? We're not going to manage your inventory. That's really, really somebody else's. um, I've got suggestions if you need suggestions on inventory management. Um, But it's like, what kind of, so does it, for example, tell you, okay, you should increase your bid to this much or you should put that into negative keywords. You should, what what kind of um, like advice the system is able to give? It, it, it definitely gives you bid suggestions. And I, I believe, and they'll have to school me if this isn't true, but it's also going to give you suggestions on what you should do based on in terms of keywords or if you should go and, and launch a competitor campaign or something like that. It's going um, gonna to make those types of suggestions so that you're... We actually have currently in advance of Flywheel 2.0, um, this opportunity analyzer that the team cooked up, that the analysts are using, the sales team is using that. And so I'd like to offer anybody who's here who wants to take advantage of that, we can do an audit for you with the opportunity analyzer. And it will kind of give you a little bit of sneak peek and a better understanding of what our software and what our tech can do for you once Flywheel 2.0 is released into the wild. And so opportunity, you said, okay, this will give you an idea of what are the opportunities in what sense? Is that, is that okay, untapped revenue or things you, optimization? Uh, Mainly optimization, yeah. untapped drop. Uh, and also one thing that we're, that we're supposed to talk about today too, is like the different types of ads that you might want to run. Yeah. So okay. um, just based on, and I think we'll probably get into the buyer journey and what your goals are, where you are in your selling journey. Are you at launch? Are you in the growth phase? Are you in the profitability phase? Or do you want to be in the profitability phase? And like what you need to do to Can get there. <laughs> right, right. Especially in this economy. I don't know. Um, yeah. Let's hope so. <laughs> yeah. And so if what I he- I'm hearing also that it's in, in infancy phase in a sense that, okay, AI will only grow from there and that it's starting to do a few things, but probably with time, this will be like a no brainer. Like people have to hop into technology because that's something which will probably invade our, our everyday life. And like what we do in terms of, of uh, like specifically for advertising, right? Oh, well, that, and I mean, I'm seeing it pop up in all sorts of different software. There's this um, content tool called Jasper AI that generates content for you. So it even has an Amazon product title and Amazon listing template where you tell it what you want it to say, and it comes up with different options for you. It's a little scary, especially from someone who comes from a writing background where I'm like, humans need to write all of the things, but this AI if you're looking to do really formulaic content, we'll do it for you. And it's just amazing. And, and I could probably think of like nine or 10 more examples where I'm seeing it out in the wild, out in different types of technologies. But um, 
<clears throat> it's definitely the future. And it's funny because someone in the team just mentioned it today on our Slack channel. Christelle said, okay, Merchant Words is offering that exactly with AI and, and creating content. So it's it's funny that, yeah, it's it's getting out but more and more. But yeah, so enough a bit on, on Tika Metric and you're right. Uh, let's jump into um, the topic today uh, of the, okay, how to diversify um, your advertising. So maybe you could, you could lay the ground. It's like, okay, You've got three types of advertising, sponsored uh, products, sponsored dis uh, sponsored brands, sorry, and sponsored display. It's like, is a diversification a matter of taking a bit of each? What's your view on that? Well, again, it depends on where you are and what your budget is. So if we want to review real quick, I mean, we've got sponsored products, sponsored brands, sponsored display, and then there's the DSP product that everybody's so excited about. And I've got pros and cons about DSP. It's super expensive unless you work with a partner, but that $35,000 over two months cap is a little daunting to a newer seller. So sponsored products, obviously, and if this is too much review for you, then stop me. But to those of you in the crowd that might not know, sponsored products just basically help promote specific products on the Amazon platform. So they can appear in search results. They can appear on product detail pages next to the buy box or on product detail pages in the carousel. So you'd want to run a sponsored product ad if you want to capture buyers that are looking for a product similar to yours, for instance. And it's the sort of like baseline Amazon ad product. And these are all the the ad products that Amazon on platform offers through Amazon advertising. So sponsored brand is more of an awareness play. So you would, you, you could show off multiple products at once. Um, you can link to your product detail page. You can link to a product list page, or you can link to your actual Amazon storefront. If you've got a really lovely Amazon storefront that someone could create for you, or you could, if you learn how to, if anybody is having any luck actually in seller central, creating your enhanced brand content all by yourself, then I am all ears because I'm trying to do it for Tickometrics has our own Amazon store and I'm trying to do it myself. And I'm like, I need help. I definitely need help with this. But um, directing people to your storefront helps create brand awareness, helps them see the other products that you're offering. And if you've got one that's like really, really nice, then that is obviously good for your brand and makes people think favorably about it. I have this whole I don't think it's a pipe dream, but the very first conversation I ever had with Alistair McLean Foreman, who's the CEO and founder of Takeometrics, I said, I would love it if we got, to, and I know this is probably totally opposite of what you want, but I would love it if we got to the point where the average consumer was searching by brand rather than by keyword. And he said, no, that's obviously the dream. I was like, and I said, not just like the Legos of the world or the, you know, um, Yetis of the world, but that there would be enough brand awareness that you would find a brand you'd like and you would stick with it. And as someone who has like peeled back the curtain and has worked with a lot of brands, I am a total sucker for a brand new brand on Amazon and packaging and watching the brand evolve and, oh, now they're doing sponsored video. Now they're doing, you know, so it's, um, I'm kind of a nerd about it. Yeah, and it's interesting because you, you were talking about we we had uh, had a meeting with a large brand I can't give the name, and the Amazon was showing that the on the millions of people which were researching that brand with the brand name, actually only 0.4 percent of the people were were buying the product, and that's typically where you say okay, there's there's probably in the need a, a big uh, pool of customers to tap into to say okay, those people we can we can try to reach and make sure that the you know, you know the product is appealing to them or we try to catch them uh, somewhere else. So um, that's uh, that, that's interesting. But like what one specific question you talked about DSP and sponsored display, uh, for example, like display and D the D and DSP is display a bit. So these are going in. A, Sometimes well, a bit, you could say against each other. What's your, what's your view on that? The D and D, and I agree with you, Riley. It is seeming like people are getting less and less loyal to brands and it's a real bummer for me, but I wish it was different. I mean, I, like I found my favorite grapeseed oil and it's a little company out of Napa Valley. And, you know, I'm just, I'm a nerd about it, but maybe it will get better. Amazon is offering 
brands a little bit more than they used to. I mean, there's Amazon Live now and you can follow brands now. So maybe we're moving in that direction. Um, but anyway, so DSP actually stands for demand side platform. So DSP is content that you push on and off Amazon. So the difference between sponsored display and DSP is that DSP is measured by CMP, cost, cost per, per mille. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, so thousands per impression. And <clears throat> it is, um, and it's seen on and off Amazon and the minimum is $35,000 over two months. I can't imagine that's gonna last forever. But that's what it's been so far. But if you work with a partner like us who has the integration to Amazon, you can avoid that $35,000 minimum for two months, which is pretty hefty price. Um, sponsored display. And I feel like DSP and sponsored display, like in terms of the purpose of them, they're both great for brand awareness. They're both great for getting your brand in front of new eyes, right? Because you're really putting it out there. Um, sponsored display only appears on Amazon. And it is, you can pay for, you can pay for com conversions per. It's, it's per click, right? It's, it's a PPC. It, so it's yeah, you can, you can pay PPC or you can pay per viewer impression, you know, depending on what type of sponsored display you're running. But the thing that I like about sponsored display is that it can, it can kind of capture relevant eyes that are at different stages of the buying process, right? So like the buying process, you've got awareness, consideration, and purchase. And with sponsored display, you're getting your brand in front of new eyes, but you can also hit people in other stages of the funnel because um, the ad can be good enough that it hits them in the consideration phase or it hits them in the purchase phase and it results from purchase so you can actually end up with a better return on your ad spend compared to a channel with a lower purchase intent like dsp and so it's it's funny because i've had uh, like uh quite a few discussions about around DSP in the, in the recent weeks and with people uh, a bit challenging the, the use of DSP. And I don't know, I get a feeling that um, people with experience of work or like who have been working with other DSPs or working with, you know, Facebook or Google or, or having larger investment of advertising investment, are uh, less uh, questioning DSP and people who are really coming from the PPC uh, background are sort of saying, yeah, but we're not seeing the kind of results uh, which we're seeing in terms of PPC. And I feel that depending on which hat or which background you have, you, you will um, consider your reaction to, to that is a bit different. What, what's your feeling on, on, on DSP? So you're coming more from a PPC background, I, I, I think, I assume. Well, definitely, like all the way back to the Google PPC age when SEO was the, I mean, that was how I became a freelance writer was because everybody needed content. Google's algorithm changed. You couldn't hide keywords in white on a white background anymore and do all this black hat SEO stuff. So people actually needed content that was written by a human that made sense. And then as Google's algorithm changed even more, you needed relevant content that linked back to authoritative sources. And we came to the world we have today where to get your website to rank, you've got to play the PPC game, but you've also got to have certain elements on your website. Same thing goes for Amazon and Amazon ads will continue to evolve as well as the algorithm will continue to evolve. And of course, Amazon keeps the algorithm a great big secret, just like they keep the buy box, um, the buy box algorithm. That's like the, that's like the Pandora's locked box like i don't even know if we want to know right but they'll never ever tell us what the buy box algorithm is and we're not ever really gonna i mean we can make guesses educated guesses on what's going to work for certain products for certain product categories what's going to work with certain ad types what kind of things you should do if you're targeting competitors you know like with uh sponsored video one cool thing that we're seeing is that if you do it right 
and you'll have to ask an analyst at Take a Metrics on how to do it right because I don't know. But if you do it a certain way, then your sponsored video can show up on your competitor's product detail page, which I think is a super powerful thing because as Riley said, people don't have brand loyalty. And if you can be the shiny thing, you're like, ooh, piece of candy, ooh, squirrel, you know, and you can be that video that's super cool and makes your product look way better. Um, yes, Riley knows more about this than I do. Product targeting via video ads. Yes, that's that's it. That's the ticket. Are you doing that, Riley? I believe she is. So. Oh, he's not. Are, so are you, are you do, doing? Are, yeah. Sorry. Oh, cool. Cool. Is it working well for you? Awesome. Good. Well, yeah, we're seeing that a lot. And actually. In answer to your question about DSP and sponsored display, we just released a benchmark report based on the data that we pulled for year over year, 2020 versus 2021, which is kind of a wonky comparison to make when you think about it, because it's all been COVID. But when COVID first started, there was that rush in e-commerce because everybody had to stay home and everybody was ordering stuff that they would have normally gone to a brick and mortar store to buy. So obviously for our data scientists, that's kind of frustrating because there are different variables, but we did see some interesting trends with sponsored display versus DSP. And I can't recall the numbers off the top of my head, but I'll be happy to share that with everybody um, after we're done because it's, it's good data and we just, it's like hot off the presses. So uh, also I hate to plug this, but it's relevant. So forgive me if it seems overly promotional, but we just did a two day virtual conference called AdMax. So Cameron Yoder, who's our director of community and content um, <clears throat> put together this amazing program where it was all our internal people who work in these ad types every day in different product verticals, in different categories, in different stages of a seller's journey in and in, in, in a brand's journey. And we pretty much told you everything you need to know about how to um, effectively advertise. And when Cameron told me about that idea, I was like, are you nuts? That's what we're selling to people. And he's like, no, the people got to know, you know? So that replay is actually available on the Take a Metrics website. Probably if you've been on LinkedIn ever, you saw ads for that thing because we really did push it around. But um, it was great. We got great feedback on it. We're going to do another one on multiple marketplaces going on a channel called Marketplace Madness. Um, so I'll make sure that everybody gets a link to sign up for that. But if you go to the Take a Metrics website, T-E-I-K-A-M-E-T-R-I-C-S, in the top banner, that's how you can access the AdMax replay. So you can actually get KB and Henry talking about the data that I just told you you could get in the benchmark report. So they'll talk through it for you. And you can also read the benchmark report. So we're trying to be pretty transparent about how to do this because the Amazon platform especially is so competitive. And Amazon, I mean, let's admit it, doesn't make it easy for you guys to to be successful. Um, there are all sorts of things that pop up. I just talked to a bunch of people, pretty big brands actually, who got the email yesterday about FBA storage limits. You know, I mean, it's, it, it, it's not like if you're big enough and if you make enough money and if you're profitable enough, you are free from Amazon's metrics and the way they judge your brand. So Mm. And if so, I've seen that some uh, hands were raised. Just put the uh, questions you have in the Q and A section, and we'll get it into a section. Uh, into a second, sorry. Um, I'd like to, if if we were to wrap up this diverse, like all of these uh, different ads, if you were to recommend, or what would be your top? If you have a top three, or what what would be from your view, or from the data you get from Tika Metrics, if you have a strong recommendation of a, uh, ones which you really should um, diversify that some people overlook sometimes or things, you know, as a summary of what we just talked about. I, I preached pretty heavily on sponsored display 
recently, we're just seeing some really good results from sponsored display and it's not as expensive as DSP. Um, so I really like that a whole lot, but- I've, Yeah, and it's funny because I've seen a lot of the Amazon teams actually pitch or push for sp sponsored display. And I was wondering if, because sometimes when they pitch, you never know if it's uh, right. <laughs> because they, you know, they are making more money or they are pushed by the management for that, or if it's really for, for results, but maybe it's a bit of both, so who knows, but it sort of, there is a consensus. I feel that, okay, sponsored display is a low hanging fruit that you really should uh, activate and maybe before jumping into DSP. Well, and look, I don't think that you should, I mean, obviously sponsored product is the building block of driving traffic to your product. So that's, I think it's important to, I don't think you need to run them all at once. I think you need to, to analyze the performance of what you've been doing and then make decisions from that. So if you're focusing on, and your KPIs are going to be different depending on what your business goals are, right? Or where you are in the seller stage where, where your brand is. So a brand in launch phase is going to focus on brand awareness and they're going to focus on their top products. So their KPIs would be the amount of impressions they get, the amount of new to brand customers they get, but they would be remiss to focus solely on their ACOS or their ROAS because when you're getting started, you just have to spend more money. Whereas a brand in growth phase is going to want to focus on increasing market share. So their KPIs would be a certain increase in brand searches, increased conversions from competitor targeted campaigns, that kind of stuff. And then if you're a brand in the profit phase, then you're going to focus on margin, average order volume, repeat purchasers, and your return on ad spend. But based on your product category, you know, I mean, it, so that's kind of how it breaks down in terms of your stages of your seller journey, but then you, you can't measure ROAS the same as a different category does, you know? I mean, there are generalizations out there, but if you're really gonna get down into your own data, you need to realize that your goals might be different based on your product category than someone else in like, say the electronics category or something like that. Or if you're in electronics, good job, and I don't envy you, but, it's just, I see a lot of brands that get frustrated and fed up because they, they have this, this grand purple squirrel sparkling unicorn idea of what their, their ACOS or what we call tacos because we like put it all together with your total advertising cost of sale. But they've got this number in mind of what their tacos should be, what their ROAS should be. And if it deviates, if their campaigns deviate from that at all, they get frustrated when really you've got to think very strategically about your advertising and then execute on a great plan that if you can't come up with it by yourself, there are lots of people out there. And, you know, I'm, of course, I'm supposed to sell the software that we use and I'm supposed to sell our managed services, but there are people you can follow on LinkedIn and Facebook who give out free advice all day long. There's things like our AdMax program that you can watch for free and, um, and you can learn a lot from that. But it's, and we're about to see some really good stuff in at Prosper Show next month. It's like less than three weeks away. I'm kind of freaking out about that. But we've got some good people that are talking about, I mean, Danny McMillan's going to talk about the Amazon algorithm. We've got Mina Elias speaking. We've got Destiny Wishon speaking. The Drive Traffic Jack is going to be lit up. I'll tell you that. And I'll be talking about software because that's what I do. But, um, and you're going to speak too, right? Indeed, I'll be talking about going international because uh, that's what we're all about. So indeed, that prosper will be very interesting. But let's jump into questions because Stuart has been waiting uh, with his question. Um, what is Amazon brand lift that has been introduced into the US? Do you think it will be launched in other markets? I think that all Amazon programs start with Amazon.com, right? But we're seeing like, I mean, it, for we're still at a place where not all ad products are available on every platform, right? So can, I you, think can you explain what is Amazon brand lift? It's still in beta. Um, and it's basically it, 
it's from within the DSP console via self-service. And it basically tells you how your ads are performing, but it bumps it against those different stages of the buyer journey, awareness, purchase intent, ad recall. So um, right now it's invitation only and it's supposed to basically help you. It gives you data so that you can make better decisions, which I'm all about. And I think it's great that Amazon's offering programs like that, but I'm always a little suspicious of things that are in beta because a lot of times Amazon will rush to get something ready and then it'll be in beta for a really long time. So I think if it's successful and if it really helps people become more successful with their DSP campaigns, I think it will absolutely roll out to other marketplaces. But I would keep an eye on the seller forums. We're going to keep an eye on it. And I would talk to other brand owners about it to see you know, who got invited, who's using it. And seller forums should be a really good place for that. But also a lot of these Facebook groups where people get together. So just like keep an eye out and keep your ear to the ground. Um, <clears throat> Amazon says that it provides objective, what did they say? Objective and concrete measurement results. So. Is it is it similar to the Amazon Marketing Clown sort of initiative giving you access to more data? And Well, I don't think that I don't think that previously we got a lot of insight into the outside of Amazon purchases that the DSP resulted in, right? So brand lift is part of the Amazon shopper panel and that's an invitation only program where people that participate in it can share receipts that they made outside of Amazon and, and and like complete surveys to give brands more data and they get rewarded for that. So Amazon's on a kick of rewarding people for sharing information and for driving traffic back to Amazon. I just did a webinar with Teresa Coates and, and Justin Coates about that, about the Amazon attribution and brand referral program. So, um, I think that's nice that Amazon is on a kick like that, where they're like, look, yeah, we want you to drive traffic to us. And I think at the end of the day, that's probably what this is, the Amazon shopper panel is about. They want to know where you're buying it that's not them so they can figure out how to make sure you don't buy it there again and you buy it on Amazon. But BrandLift is basically a, a, a program that is helping you quantify how your Amazon ad campaigns are driving the marketing objectives associated with the buyer journey. Does that make sense? okay no makes sense and you're right like most of the time it it can be anything between six months and two years before it got, it comes usually first the uk and then germany and then the others uh it depends how beta is beta <laughs> so if it's like if it's right. really not ready then it will take more time because they need to fix it before they roll it out uh, everywhere so um and you're right <laughs> many times like uh, amazon attribution is in beta and we like a lot of our teams are really questioning the the reality of the data inside so it's um it's um yeah it's not it, it will probably take a bit of time uh, but i think it's a uh, like you said it's very interesting because amazon is investing a lot of things and and sharing and and like investing in tools to be able to share a lot of data with the, the people uh, using it. So that that's really interesting. I had another question that uh, pop up about uh, ROAS and the way you um, use you, you and TACOS. So TACOS is taking uh, uh, like uh, the return on the ad, uh, return of ads on the total sales. Now, the question is um, when sometimes your, your return, your ROAS on uh, PPC campaigns and DSP campaigns could be very different, right? One could be really generating a lot of sales, and the other one actually is a bit about brand building, more upper funnel. Does it make sense to put it all together in a total ROAS or a total TACOS? You, it's, you're looking at two different ways. What, what's your view on that? Well, I think you need to do it per ad group and per product, honestly, because otherwise you're going to get a skewed view of your performance. So depending on the type of product it is, 
depending on the ads you're running, the types of ads you're running on it, because like your ROAS is not going to be as good on a sponsored display ad as it is going to be on a sponsored product ad. I mean, that's just the way it is because sponsored product, they click on the product, they buy the product, hopefully, right? But with sponsored display, you're hoping they click through and then depending on where you're pointing them, you know, it's just not, it's not the same. So what I do recommend people, and that's why it's great to use software where you can see per ASIN what, so you can see your overall tacos, you can see your overall ROAS, but to see it broken down per item, per, per SKU is better because you're able to make better decisions for each product. It's more time consuming but it's the only way to get a clear view of your actual performance by product, which you should care about unless you've got a bunch of products and it's just all variations of the same product. But if you've got different products with different purposes, then it's absolutely essential that you measure your performance per product. Okay. And the tool enables you to go in that level of granularity, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. And um, so an, another question um, I had was um, uh, my my mind just went uh, blank for a second. Um, the the my, question mine does that was a lot. sorry. Mine does that a lot. Yeah, that's, that happens to the best of us. Um, we talked about uh, ACOS and uh, TACOS. Ah, yes, the, the, I found my question is about okay. What's a uh, golden number? Someone asked me today. You know. What's a golden number in terms of tacos? What, do you have um, uh, something you recommend? And then it's about, okay, how much, where, where should it, you know, play or? Well, so, I mean, there's not a golden number, I don't think. But they will say, it says that if you Google what's a good ROAS on Amazon, then you're going to get the answer that it's like a, a four to one ratio generally. But that's that's those numbers I was talking about before that people go into advertising on Amazon with these numbers in their head. And then when those num those numbers are different than those numbers, when their numbers are different, then they all of a sudden think this isn't working. When in fact, there are so many different factors you have to consider that you can't really use that golden number if you're at any point other than a pure profitability stage and you've got your entire everything all sorted out, you know? And you've, you've got your formula. And even when you've got your formula, the platform changes so often and buyer behavior changes for certain reasons. Like who would have thought COVID would have happened and buyer behavior would have changed so much. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's dangerous to think about that golden number, but if you're, you know, if you're insistent on it, it's out there, but I don't think that you should be thinking that way. Yeah. Cause the thing is, what I find as an exercise is that depending if you're a seller, so you have you have a percentage on on sales out. If you're a vendor or one P, it's on sales in. So it's it's very difficult to give um, uh, a target. Typically, Amazon tends to say fifteen percent, but then you know fifteen percent on sales in or fifteen percent on sales out is a, <laughs> a lot more money usually because uh, yeah. the sales out will be much higher. Uh, but that's an interesting um, thing. Do you have this kind of data? And sorry, that's perhaps a, a tricky question. Uh, on ticker metrics of okay what's an average kind of tech cost all over the brands like uh, in in like on a big pool of data well i'm sure yes i mean i don't know the number okay. but but again there are so many different factors involved with measuring the success of your campaigns on amazon and your ad spend and you know th th there's i so yes, I'm sure we could get you that number, but um, not now. <laughs> well, so that, no, not cool. now. And I don't think it's a good idea because based on your product category, based on your mm -hmm. business model, based on your business goals, that number is going to vary wildly. Okay. Um, another question is, okay, what do you do if uh, for a brand which has got um, a small budget, uh, how, what, what, what's your um like tip for them if you're you have you don't have enough a lot of money and i had another discussion today for example with another brand wanting to grow a lot but 
with like a limited or defined budget how does that not a percentage of sales but it's like they were allowed an amount of money for the year what what's your tip on that well if you've got great products and you've got great product pages then the easiest place to start and the most affordable place to start is with sponsored product ads what i hate to see is a brand that is has got a lot of potential for increased brand awareness and they're not experimenting with a, a smaller budget so maybe not as you know maybe a campaign that's not as long but they're not at least experimenting long enough with a different ad type in order to see if that's going to help them grow but if you're on a just like absolutely tiny budget then focus on sponsored products because your tacos and your rice are going to be better yeah so it's like a lower funnel uh, action which will uh, retrieve better results um, well and then the more you sell the more you can spend and i was talking to somebody who's looking into buying a brand the other day and both of the prospectuses the prospectuses prospecti both documents he got on each brand the brands had been spending at least half of their earnings on advertising and not amazon advertising they were spending on facebook advertising okay. and google ads and all that kind of stuff and so um and he asked me do you really have to spend half your money to make half that back and i said no you don't have to do that <laughs> and that's probably why these brands are for sale um but you do especially when you're in launch phase especially if you've had an unfortunate situation like you've run out of stock and you had trouble restocking if you've gone through an amazon suspension situation you've gone through asin suspensions if anything negative has happened to your account you've got product reviews removed for some reason um then you need to build back up you need to start building your sales back up but i do think that a sweet little balance between sponsored product sponsored brand and then maybe dip into sponsored display and wait until you've got the budget for dsp but um it's also you know i i talked to a lot of i know a lot of brands that are big they make a lot of money on amazon and they haven't bothered with an amazon storefront yet um, they have gotten brand registry, but they haven't done anything with brand registry. I know people who sell well over a million dollars a year who haven't bothered with brand registry. And you can't even access those other ad products if you don't have brand registry. So all you can do is sponsor products. So use my advice is always use the tools that Amazon provides and then use expert advice to use those tools properly. And don't go crazy too. And you've got, to, I mean, we didn't even talk about keyword strategy. I guess that'll have to be another webinar. But I, I can't tell you how often I see a brand and their keyword strategy is like completely off or they're totally cannibalizing their own keywords. So let's dive into that for two seconds because that, that's a topic we love. When, when let's say, a brand or a company has got two products uh, or even two sub brands, let's say, which are competing against each other. How do you, what's your tip about, okay, um, managing this sort of uh, keywords, which will bid against each other or like two products, which will bid against each other from the, so you're the one financing it. How do you, how do you avoid that? What, what's your, that's a great question that I don't know the answer to, but I do see a lot of times, luckily our, our managed services people have this little ad services channel where they give each other advice or they share observations and stuff. And they talk about this a lot. And I've actually seen a lot of content from, I think Mina posted something recently and Ritu, do you know Ritu? She's a genius. Ritu Java from PPC Ninja. I guess I shouldn't be talking about like technical competitors or whatever, but she's so smart. Um, but they were talking about what you should do in terms of competing keywords. And I guess that would work also if you've got competing keywords within your own product set. But I, I don't know, but I know people who do. No, and we can, we can put that in the links. The, the, one of the, so, on, on those keywords and on what you were saying. So what, what are your main tips on, on the keyword strategies or what, you know, because keywords is 
uh, SEO optimization keywords, uh, because keywords go into advertising, go into content. So it's a big topic, right? About, okay, how do you optimize? You keep on optimizing your listings or being up to date with, with keywords. What, what's your, what's your like tips there or like uh, remarks? Well, so first of all, research, keyword research, everybody's got to do it. Nobody is beyond needing to do keyword research. Um, you have should to know you do what... it all the time. So should it be ongoing all the time? What... I think you need to be analyzing your keywords pretty often. I think that you're going to have keywords that are your like go-to keywords, but then that those keywords in particular could see an increase in competition. There could be a new perception about your product that you can add to your backend keywords. You can add to your keywords on your product detail page. So I, I do think that it's smart. I mean, you don't have to do it every single day, but I do think it's smart to do a self audit, you know, and I tell went back when I was working for um, Ecom Engine and I was talking about product reviews all the time. And I said, if you're sending product review requests, you need to look at it pretty often, make sure it's within Amazon's policy, because that was the big deal with product reviews is that Amazon kept changing the rules about what you could say in a message and people were getting in all sorts of trouble. You're not going to get in trouble with advertising because you're not allowed to advertise certain things and you know that and all that kind of stuff, but you're going to get in trouble in terms of your budget, your margin and your competition. If you don't do a self audit often enough to catch places where you could be optimizing your campaigns and optimizing your product detail pages, optimizing your images, you know, I mean, there's a lot that you have to think about. Hmm. Thank I think that that's very, um, that's very true. Maybe, and that will be around the, the last question. So if anybody's got questions, you can put them in the Q&A uh, side. But well, a question I like to ask, it because it's great to to share these kind of stories, like do you have a good success story and a, and a fail story, let's say, um, to, to share and, and learnings about that? Let's do the same story for both. And let's start with the fail. So I was talking to a brand that all of the sudden their sales just went and they were like, we don't know what happened. We're running ads, same as we were, we, we don't know what happened. And so I took a look and they had recently gotten somebody to do their storefront and their enhanced brand content. And it was all images. There were no words in it because it was all pictures. And I was like, well, that's probably a problem because there are no keywords for searches to hook onto. So they fixed all that and then their sales went right back to where they needed to be. And then they were able to, at the same time, analyze the keywords they were using before and come up with better keywords and a better keyword strategy for fixing the problem. And then that way they were able to play with different ad types to even make more money than they were before. So that's keywords, an example. Yeah. That's an example of making sure your product detail pages are great, making sure your um, your storefront is has got what it needs, like keywords on it. And then when you get that fix, then you refine your ad strategy. Okay. And um, talking about uh, tools and technology, for example, is like, is there a soft, like a, a point where like technology makes sense at, at what point let's say in terms of how much is it the ad spent amount on the under which it doesn't make sense and above which you really should think about i feel like if you're just starting out it's valuable to learn how to work within your ad console you know i never try to I, I mean, I don't sell anyway. I mean, if they put me in sales, I'd get fired like today because I always want to give everything away for free and because um, I'm just terrible at it. But <clears throat> I never try to talk anybody into using technology until they actually know how to do it manually. Um, if they don't want to learn it manually, then that's fine. They can use a tool or they can just say, hey, do this for me. And hey, you guys do the keyword research and you guys create my listings and you guys, and that's fine. That's valid. If you want to do that, I'm not going to judge you for it. But if you're into understanding what a managed services arm or what a software tool is going to do for you, I think that you 
I have a better idea of having expectations that are managed correctly if you know what it takes to actually do it yourself. I might get in trouble for saying that. So sorry, team. But um, I mean, because it's not easy, is it? I mean, like I said, we've got our store. I've been trying to create listings. I've been trying to figure out how to create the storefront and all that kind of stuff. I'm working inside Seller Central is no picnic. And it changes. I was on a screen share with somebody and they're like, oh, you're using the old one. And I was like, how do I get the new one? Nobody told me. I don't have a button. I can click like switch to the new Seller Central. Yeah. And that, so, but- and like but is there a sweet number is it like um, you have to spend at least ten thousand a month would would there be a number uh, like- i'd say that you should use software tool you should use a software tool if you're spending you know i don't know what the number would be per month but if you're getting to the point where it's taking you more time to manage your advertising than it is to do the other things in your business that help you be profitable then it's time to get a software tool one cool thing about our software is that when flywheel 2.0 comes out you're going to be able to get it look at it and it's pretty much going to tell you when it's time to start using a, a software to advertise. So you're going to be able to access your data before you actually start using the tool to advertise. And it's pretty much going to tell you, okay, now it's time. So that's kind of cool. But I think once you get to the point where you're managing multiple product lines, when you've decided to buy another brand, if you're, um, If you're, I mean, I would say if you're spending more than $10,000 a month, then it's time to get somebody to just do it for you. Mm. That's a good, uh, 120,000 a year. That's a, that's a good, that's a good advice. Let's take a couple of minutes to, to finish, to talk a bit about Prosper, uh, which is going to be, so, so maybe you can give a a small elevator pitch about uh, why, why people should go to Prosper. Absolutely. It would be my pleasure. So Prosper is kind of the, the you know in the u.s we have the oscars it's sort of like the it's the big show right i mean you've got retail x you've got ces you've got things that are like retail oriented but prosper is the biggest show that is dedicated to e-commerce professionals especially amazon sellers and brian anderson who is the guy that's in charge of it is hyper focused on awesome education um And so in the years that he's been, you know, it's legacy, James Thompson started it, you know, you knew it was going to be good. And so this year we've got six different tracks, I think. And there's the two day drive traffic track. There's a manage your brand, grow your brand. Um, There's going to, they're going to be sessions about managing inventory, maybe pivoting away from FBA if there continue to be these supply chain issues. Um, Add to the fact that it, I was just talking to the guy that manages the booth sales. And he said that this is the, they've never had many, any, they've never had as many exhibitors in a given year as they have this year. So they had to actually move to a bigger room at the Mandalay Bay. And it's at the Mandalay Bay, which is better than the Westgate because it was at the Westgate for three years and you, but um, well, we did have that one year that was virtual. So we didn't have to go then, but yeah, so Las Vegas, Nevada, USA, March 13th, 14th, and then the 15th is the workshop day. So you can pay extra to go to these three workshops that are intensive, a couple hours long each. Um, And there are going to be a lot of parties afterwards, lots of great networking opportunities. But what I'm most excited about is the education people are going to get in the rooms, in the sessions, because the agenda is just rocking. We could probably put a link in the show notes, right? To to the website, but, and we can also put, you've got a code, I've got a code, so we can put our codes in there so that people can get a hundred dollars off a ticket, but I think it's going to be great. So that will be our end parting words. Thank you very much, Liz. So Thank you. The Jerome. Prosper Show will be very exciting. Uh, check out the Tika Metrics uh, page. You will see a lot of resources there and it was a pleasure, Liz, and Thank I'll see you face to face very soon. Next month. Indeed. Thanks. Thank you very much, everyone. Happy day or happy evening, everyone. Bye-bye.